Tante Brenda Nitsiagason, uh, Mia Tante Uochi, uh, Jasper National Park. But uh, I now live here in Sundry, Alberta, just north of Sundry. And uh, we do our operations uh, in Banff and Canmore, and a little bit in our new location here. So I'm sorry, Jordan, I'm Miki Sayogasan. Uh, I'm here with uh, Mohican Trails. I've been uh, working uh, for the company on and off since I was about uh, 16. Uh, but we've recently got so busy that uh, now I'm here full time, usually operating in Banff. Hi, I'm, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm Brenda's husband, and we formulated the company many years ago. And from both of our skills, we, we've molded it, put it together with these fine folks around us. Can't say, my name's Jake. I'm from Jamelo, Alberta. Uh, I've been with uh, Mehican Trails for just for the summer now. Uh, went through a training program with uh, Brenda uh, and then Brenda's sister, Tracy, through Rupert Plan. Now, now I'm here. Can't say hello. My name is Bridget. I am Métis. I grew up in Topield, Alberta, um, and I've known Brenda for a few na few years now, um, and she has been really instrumental in my reconnection journey as a Métis person um, and learning about my culture um, and as well guiding. You. So, what sort of packages do you offer here? So, through many years of uh, operating in the Bow Valley, both Canmore and Banff, we have gone through various iterations of uh, Mohican Trails. We initially started in 1995 working specifically for British military, and then we moved on to the tourism sector around the year 2000. So, we've been operating in the area for a really long time and uh, have learned a few things along the way. One of the things that we began to really recognize was the cultural aspects of the company. People were fascinated by indigenous culture, and so that has always been the hallmark of everything that we've done from the very beginning. And through time, though, we began to recognize how very savvy tourists are becoming, and they wanted more and more. And so we start to deliver more and more. However, we began to change what we did and made things a whole lot more simple because one of the things I began to recognize with people was they were looking for, I guess, simplicity. They were looking for uh, reconnection, just the way many indigenous people are looking for reconnection. Um, and so we began to really refine what we did in a very significant way. And in the Bath and Canmore area, we are more heavily focused on doing medicine walks and connecting people to the land. We have really refined our programs to be much more simplistic because one of the things that we've really recognized in people over the last four or five years is how much they want to reconnect to the land, very much like we do. It's such an important part of who we are and our culture and everything that the land gifts to us, it gifts to everybody, it doesn't matter who you are. And this is part of the reason why we um, began to just focus on shorter medicine walks. We can take groups of people out onto the land and give them a really good experience without really overwhelming them with too much detail. So uh, that's kind of uh, in a nutshell in terms of the Canmore area. One of the other things that we did, we've changed location uh, with our, our main office and we have um, moved to a piece of land where we can do more things with people. What we started to recognize was people were more and more interested in, be able, in being able to actually participate in maybe harvesting some of the plants off the land and learning more about them that way, as well as the respectful nature that we have for harvesting. They wanted to do more, they wanted to apply more, and so many of the things that we offer are medicine workshops for people as well so they can get really hands-on and learn a little bit more about making teas and making salves and, and um, creams and various other things that are useful to them. Maybe everyone could share a, like their favorite package or tour to give. Or... All right. Do you want to start, Jordan, your favorite tour to do? Uh, yeah, so uh, my favorite tour to do uh, are the, um, uh, the guided walks at uh, Cascade Pond. So and just why? outside of Banff. Um, it's uh, like a, all of the biodiversity that I need to really do my tour completely. Um, and it's uh, you know, a short loop 
uh, a lot more uh, talking than walking, and uh, when you've got small groups, it's just kind of a more um, intimate experience. Yeah, my favorite program that we run is uh, uh, more about traditional programs uh, around bushcraft, hands-on crafting. And um, we've really started to aim at the traditional crafts that are produced here in Canada from, from all the people that, that I've been uh, privileged to, to, to work with, with, with N.A., uh, uh, Cortino, Honey Poutine, Cree, Blackfoot, Sukina, Okay. <laughs> um, my favorite uh, program to run, um, I think I enjoy the, the medicine workshops the most. They're the ones that are most fulfilling. Um, they're two days long, <laughs> so you really get to know people uh, on a very deep level. And um, uh, there's a lot of gifts that they bring to the programs as well, and that's what I enjoy the most. My favorite programs have definitely been more of a land-based or a practical skills, like teaching a group of like youth how to do like a flip-flop winch, or teaching them like wildlife identification or like land, like traditional land skills. Um, I think my favorite programs to run are um, the ones where I get to address the history um, and sort of the, the cultural box that we do. So. Um, especially teaching people about um, the Métis history um, and culture because it's something that is not very well known about and that um, I'm really passionate about. Um, and I think my favorite groups are when I actually get um, a crowd of Indigenous people who are looking to reconnect um, and I can be a part of that journey for them. How has the Alberta community received your business? The Alberta community has been really uh, interested in Indigenous culture for a long period of time and many of the non-Indigenous people just simply didn't really know how to reach out to us specifically so as tourism has grown in Alberta significantly and in particular Indigenous tourism it's opened the doors a lot more to our fellow Albertans to reach out to us to connect with us and to uh, uh, come and join in on some of our walks and programs. Do you think everyone could share like their favorite experience? Like if you had like, you know, you gave like a tour and then you like, you finished it, you came home and you're like, you wouldn't believe how awesome this was? Um, I'm going to kind of start one that I can talk about with, with, uh, with these guys a little bit. So um, I was uh, contacted by um, the uh, a First Nations group where they had a variety of um, uh, chiefs that were coming together and, uh, and doing some talks and they wanted to walk on the land with us. And uh, Jordan came along and uh, he was kind of the main guy really. And um, there was uh, one of the chiefs, she was um, a, a fairly small lady and, uh, and, and uh, a little bit elderly. And um, she was having such a great time with Jordan and he was really stringing her along and with one of the stories that he tells in the area, which is a lot of fun, uh, and he would ask the group questions, and uh, the answer was really quite obvious, but they, they kind of didn't really get it. They would make an answer, and Jordan would give the uh, obvious answer, and I just remember this this one chief, she was just so delighted in it. She would just like squeeze her arms in her hands and, and start laughing at Jordan's replies, so um, I got a real kick out of that one. Well, one of the most poignant memories that I have when I was guiding was um, some years back, um, Dave's brother was over visiting us. <clears throat> he was living in Germany at the time. So he came over to visit and um, I got a call from the concierge out in the Kananaskis and uh, they asked if I would take uh, a group of three uh, family members out there, a Japanese family. And, um, and I said, for sure, we went out there. So I brought Mike along with me and uh, it was a good thing that we did because when I got there, um, I walked in and I asked the concierge who the family was, and it was very obvious that the, the dad was blind. And so I thought, oh boy, how am I going to handle this one? Because this whole place is all about, it's all about scenery, it's all about you know, the, the beauty of the land. But I, uh, I realized very quickly that, no, I, I think there's other ways that we can share information. And so, uh, I decided to take them out anyway, and um, I, uh, the dad wanted to walk um, arm in arm with me, which was great, but we very quickly found out that the mother 
was also banned. <laughs> so thankfully Mike was there and he took her arm and the daughter was the only one that spoke English uh, and she was fully sighted of course. But we did manage to communicate quite well and a couple of things that happened that were really sort of mind-boggling to me was I decided to help them uh, understand the land through their different senses and we went to um, a pine tree and a spruce tree and I had them feel the difference of the bark between the two of them and um, and they were listening to the different sounds of the leaves and it was pretty incredible that they could they could distinguish the difference through the sounds and then I took the dad over to a tree and made him touch it and he knew exactly what it was just by feeling it and every single tree he touched he could identify it and as we could progress um, there's this beautiful spot down by the river and I asked uh, I asked the uh, the daughter do you think it's okay if we walk down there because it's it's pretty rough terrain and she said oh absolutely they'll be fine so the dad was holding on to my arm and Mike was walking with the mother of course and I felt like it was really rough terrain so I was, I was tensing a lot every time we would move around like an object and I felt clumsy because this man seemed to pick up on every time I would tense and he would literally float down the trail and I was the stumbling bumbling fool going down the trail and Mike reported the same thing they were so in tune with how we reacted to the landscape they just simply knew how to navigate it and when we got down to the bottom of the trail there were some deer and elk tracks and um, so we, we placed his fingers and her fingers into the tracks and um, and said female or male and he would take his hand up and we'd smell and um, so we we're like oh okay that's interesting and then we um, got them to to the water and he reaches in and he lifts his hand into the water and he smells and he says it's clear and I'm like are you sure you're blind <laughs> it was really interesting and I, I was in awe and then we went back up to the top of the hill and there was another trail that we walked on and um, there's these really big huge ditches in the uh, in, in the middle of the trail and I didn't quite know how to tell him that and I went yeah bye yeah bye so we stopped danger so we stopped and then I carefully stepped down and he stepped down with me and I said what is it and he understood a bit of English and he goes dinosaur tracks so we all started <laughs> laughing and then I knew every time we were going to come to one of these I'd shout out dinosaur track and the whole group would laugh and step in and then I took him there was a, a female moose that had been walking through with her calf and he bent down and he touched the track and he goes female and it was just so humbling to me to walk with people like that but at the very end of the the trip the dad kind of turns to me and of course he can't see me but he held both of my hands and he had, he was crying and he said nobody's ever done this for me nobody would take a blind man out I mean this was translated through his daughter as well but he was just so um, honored to be able to touch the land in a different way that other people didn't know how to share with him and it really made me feel that my abilities to help people to connect not through their sight was pretty spectacular to me by that by that time I realized I have some gifts that way as well so that's that was one of the stories that stuck with me always has that impacted the tours that you've given since the way that I um, conducted the tour that day has always formed the way that I share the land with people now because I recognize in such a strong way that there's different ways that people will come to the land even if they are sighted they may not they may not approach the land in that way I know I don't I approach the land very much by feel and so it's uh, it's a great way to try and introduce people in a different different through different senses I think along that uh, kind of guideline there is that you know, Brenda and I would run uh, week-long trips taking clients out from uh, the USA, uh, hiking around the Canada Damascus, Banff, Camel area. And we would spend um, five days with these people and quite often on day one we'd be there looking at the forest and talking about the plants within the forest. And then we had one lady from New York say, well, what are you looking at? And I said, well, I'm looking at the bright yellow flower that's, that's in the forest about 20 feet. 
I have to talk imperial to our American friends there. <laughs> and, um, and she said, but I can't see it. She said, I can see the trees. And we realized that their, their vision was stopping at this wall of trees that was on the edge of the trail. And they weren't looking into the forest. And so we had to teach these people how to look into the forest. Now this is because a lot of these people live in New York um, or DC, Washington DC, and w walking around the streets there, and their vision stops at the signs on the streets, the, the, the walls of the buildings, and they don't know how to look through something. So being able to look through something and into the forest and observe the treasures that the forest can offer us um, it does, does take a little bit of skill for these people. So we would uh, introduce an exercise to our clients quite early on, uh, looking through our lives. So the ability to stand there and look at everything that's in front of us. And we'd work our, our clients through a series of exercises to, to observe the colors and the textures and what's actually there in front of us. And then we get to close our eyes and listen to the sounds and then smell everything around. So bringing all the senses into the one grouping that they'd be able to reference each and every day on the height, a series of heights that we would take them through. Do you ever have clients reach out afterwards talking about how that's impacted their lives? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and in fact, I can share a story with a family um, that actually left me completely shocked in a good way. Um, I was uh, contacted by a British couple and they asked to come out on the land. They had two children with them and um, they wanted to see wolves and bears and other animals. And so I, um, I said, well, I can't guarantee that you'll see the animals, but I can guarantee you will find signs of the animals. And so we went out onto the land. Um, I took them into a forest and we saw uh, signs, actually bear traps on a tree where um, moms would teach their cubs to go up and down the tree. Um, and then we went to a spot on the river where there were some wolf traps. And uh, we kind of sat down around that and I gave them some teachings. But in the meantime, I pulled out of my pack some plaster of Paris and I created a wolf cast for them. And it just did some of the teachings. And then I pulled the casting out and I, I cleaned it up. And I handed it to the, the kids and I said, this is your gift to take home. And I showed them how to care for it. And uh, we had a great day and, and they left. And uh, that, that was it, I thought, you know, I had a good time. And about two years later, I was uh, walking in the town of Canmore and they had just opened up a, uh, um, called, a shop called Cafe Books where you could go in and sit down and read and drink coffee and kind of like chapters does. And uh, I was sat in this cafe and this man approached me. And uh, I suddenly recognized him. He was the dad that had been on the tour years, two years before. And uh, I, I said, are you guys visiting again? And he said, no, we own the shop. And his wife was a prominent doctor in the United Kingdom. He had his own contracting business. And the day that they spent with me was very meaningful. And he recognized how important it was for his children to have that kind of a life. So. They went home and immediately applied to immigrate to Canada. And I was so shocked that just that day with me influenced people to change their lives. Has so anyone had a chance about their own favorite or crazy adventures? I thought about the ribbon skirt workshop that you had done. So about a year ago, I was actually piloting um, a ribbon skirt workshop program. Um, it's a three-day workshop where um, targeted towards women to come um, and make their own ribbon scripts and, and kind of learn about them and some of the teachings and such. Um, and this is the first time running this, this program, um, so I was quite nervous and um, not really sure how it was going to go. Um, and we get three women, um, one of them was a, um, a British lady who was now working um, in the Canmore area, and she just wanted to learn um, kind of the local culture and learn more about Indigenous peoples um, in the area, and so that's why she had come. And then we got a, a mother-daughter um, duo who came, um, and the daughter was Métis and, um, from her dad's side, and she had just kind of learned that she was Métis, um, and she was looking to, to come and to reconnect um, and to 
kind of find some community um, and just learn more about the, her culture and um, her history. And um, the way that I run that program is I, I try to make it a safe, um, open space for people because part of, of that like journey of the ribbon skirts, um, of some of the teachings that go with that has to do with sort of that healing journey as well for women. Um, and so uh, when, I, when I opened up the circle, kind of right at the beginning of the program, um, just for anybody who wanted to kind of share um, anything that they wanted to, to focus on for the weekend for their own personal healing, um, uh, the daughter, she started, she just started crying um, in a very good healing way because she um, went on about how she had been looking for something like this for so long and how she was so um, excited to, to be there and just so grateful um, to have a space to learn these things um, and to meet people um, and, and reconnect. Um, and it was quite humbling for me because uh, not growing up in my culture, I didn't really realize that I had things to offer back to the community. Um, I only started to really get involved and learn and um, about my culture and being the community about four or five years ago. And so uh, coming to a point where I could realize that I actually had things to offer back to my community um, and to have connection with people in community um, was a really amazing experience for me. And it was something that was just very reaffirming that I was on the right path. Um, and one of those experiences where you realize that everything you've been working towards um, has a purpose and it is going somewhere else. Um, and one of those things that inspires you to continue on that path and that journey. Um, and it's quite incredible because I actually still talk to this woman through email quite consistently. So that was, that was a really impactful experience. Thank you for sharing. My favorite experience so far working like would probably have to be my start of my journey into this industry. Uh, so like I said before, I, we, I went through a, uh, what was it, six week? Six week training program partnership through the M&A, Rupert's Land, and then uh, Tracy, Brenda's sister, and Brenda herself, they uh, did this training program. And it went through a bunch of different, like essential skills with the industry. So all the qualifications we need, OCC, uh, Wilderness First Aid, uh, the Interpretive Guide Association, and then like the three C's and like pretty much everything you need to be able to work in the parks. And through that, uh, also my favorite part of that was the cultural aspect of it, like learning how to take my own culture, which I have been connected through my life. It just never had the opportunity to take that information, be able to make a living off of it and dive more into it. Yeah, and that's pretty much been my favorite experience through this whole thing so far. Thank you for sharing. I was recently um, actually giving a, a talk. It was an indoor program, and I have a group of about 40 people. And uh, this program, kind of the main focus is uh, how, you know, the buffalo uh, played an important part uh, in our way of life traditionally. And then we, we usually get to the, uh, the question and answer portion. We've got about 15 minutes near the end of the talk. And uh, when people ask me about uh, reconnecting uh, with my culture, when I mentioned that we finally uh, managed to uh, uh, get our full status back, uh, it was met with a standing ovation for the entire crowd. That must have been beautiful. Mm -hmm. I must ask Brenda, Dave, how has it been to watch you know, your team and your family grow through the business, both culturally, individually, and together? I think throughout my time running the business, um, through many years, we've had on and off people that have worked for us. We used to do a lot of big team building programs, and so we would contract people in and out. But we never really had a full team that um, that worked on a, on a regular basis with us. And so this is one of the first years that we had the opportunity to do that. And uh, both Bridget and Jay, um, many of the students were, you know, real shining stars, but I kind of felt that uh, both Bridget and Jay had something very special in terms of the journeys that they that they took, uh, both to their culture. I mean, Jay's always been immersed in this culture, and Bridget is somebody that has really embraced the, uh, the teachings behind that. 
and uh, as well as having Jordan evolved from the time he was really young. <laughs> he had to be a part of it since he was very small. But it's been really quite fulfilling to me personally to be able to see um, the opportunities that are out there for the youth and then to have both Bridget and Jay forming as such a solid part of our team. And for me to be able to see the gifts that they had and then for them to recognize them in a very different way as well has been a really amazing experience for me to watch this kind of blossoming happening and Bridget's had such a deep uh, desire and love for the medicines and to learn more and more about that and has taken that on in such an amazing way um, as, as well as Jay um, really beginning your journey with um, with the guiding world and really taking to it like a duck to water. He's, he's such a natural at it. And I think it's been such a gift to me to, to have all three of them form this really cohesive unit um, as guides and share their gifts in such a beautiful and natural way. It's expanded the team in ways that I, I guess I couldn't really have ever imagined or anticipated was going to happen. I knew good things would happen, but I never really expected the, the level um, that, that these guys have performed at in such an amazing way. Um, to the point where I was incredibly comfortable to just kind of throw them out there and go, here you go, have fun. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the comments that I get back from some of our incredibly important partners that we, uh, that we provide experiences for their clients the comments that I get back are, are nothing less than outstanding, excellent. Um, people were saying things like, these guys rock my world. These people have completely changed my entire perspective. I never understood indigenous uh, perspectives from this, from this way. Those types of comments come back to me all of the time. So it's been, uh, it's been very fulfilling to see that happen. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jay's head just dropped. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And of course, with Jordan, because he's been he's been such a, a, a long term with us as well. You know, you kind of forget that. You know, as my own son, you kind of forget the, the real um, gifts that they have because I'm not out there with them all the time. I, I no longer do a lot of the walks. I only do some. Uh, very specialized circumstances that I that I do the medicine walks now, but um, you know Jordan's really been such a front runner for us as well because he's really taken up um, the, the position as as a lead guide and has done stellar things. I mean, I used to get a lot of requests for me, and now I hear, can we have the fun guide <laughs> instead? Uh, which is great. I think it's wonderful because Jordan has a very different perspective. And same thing again. We, I, I know I can very comfortably um, send him out with some of our very high-profile clients, and uh, and that he will do um, a very different perspective than I will. But what he delivers uh, really gives people with uh, a beautiful time. So all three of them have, have done great. How has it been, Jordan, to assume this growing role? Um, well, I mean, not necessarily through Mohican Trails, but I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, when uh, we, we go out on the trail together, um, what I do is, at the beginning, I was the one doing all the talking, but I just slowly start backing off and get them to do more and more and more. Tanse, my name is Jake. I am uh, Métis and Cree. I'm from uh, Drumheller, Alberta, but originally my family's from up north, north uh, Fort Vermillion area, Buttertown. How long have you been working for Mohican Trails? I have been working for Mohican Trails for just this summer. Uh, I've, I started about, it was mid-May after the training program. Went home for two weeks, got everything completed there, and then I was right back out here starting work. If you could summarize your experience so far in a few sentences. What would you say about oh, it? Just a few sentences. Chaotic, but very good. Just <laughs> all a bunch of information just shoved into your head and just get out there and learn. What do you think has been the most impactful lesson you've learned so far? Just the probably the most impactful one for like as an in, like for my 
self would probably be the fact that I actually do enjoy people. It's just I enjoy people on a much smaller, more intimate scale, kind of like the tours that we, we run. Can you tell me about your experiences made tea? My experiences made tea, uh, so I grew up within my culture and then I also grew up with uh, my mom, mother's culture too. My father's made tea, my mother's uh, Scottish and uh, English, like uh, settlers. So very interesting kind of that dynamic of being highly in one and then also kind of live in between those lines but that is a very Métis experience anyways. You develop a two-eyed seeing. Yeah. Thing. For those who don't know about the Métis, what would you tell them about uh, the Métis? It's a beautiful culture. It's very much uh, a culture of kind of the uh, bridge between both worlds in a way because we have a lot of those indigenous experiences but then we also have very much rooted into our culture of the European side too so it's kind of that connecting bridge that I think that's kind of what this country needs at the end of the day. Absolutely and how has working here impacted your cultural identity? <laughs> Definitely cemented into that that is who I am fully. Awesome. Tom say hello my name is Bridget um, I am a Métis guide for Mohican Trails. I grew up in Tofield, Alberta. Um, I've been with Mohican Trails for about a year now. So this is my, my second uh, season guiding for them. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience with Métis? Yeah, um, so I didn't uh, actually grow up in my culture. Um, very common story for a lot of Métis um, having to kind of leave their culture behind um, as a survival method. Um, that's what happened to my family. Um, my great-grandfather left Manitoba, um, where he grew up, and hid the fact that he was Métis because um, it was the best chance of survival for our family. Um, and then after he passed, my grandmother, my Cookham, um, she did a lot of the work to kind of find out about where we had come from and that the genealogy. Um, unfortunately, by this time, both herself and my dad had already been raised out of the culture. Um, but she doing that work has been a really instrumental part um, of pushing me to reconnect as well. Um, and that has kind of been a huge sort of impact and push factor for me um, as a guide and in the guiding world and working here at Mohican Trails. That was a, that's a huge part of that journey for me. So. Do you have any advice for any other Métis or Indigenous who are reconnecting? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is like don't feel ashamed about the fact that you don't like know anything or haven't um, grown up in that because that's not your fault um, and I think that's something that I struggled with for a long time was feeling like ashamed for not knowing anything and that's a pretty common um, thing that happens and it's still something that I have to work through sometimes um, because just the reality is is that there isn't any shame about like coming to the elders or coming to people in the community to ask questions and to reconnect like that's what the community wants. Um, and that's a really important part of your healing. So. How has working here at the Mexican Trails impacted your reconnection journey? Um, it, it has been um, honestly like instrumental through the whole thing, um, especially working with Brenda and her sister Tracy, the, the level of mentorship that they offer, um, as well as the, the cultural knowledge and skills that, that have come with that, but also just um, in general working for them and working with them you are automatically um just accepted into the community and it was such a actual like cultural shock at first um because to just be brought into the cultural world like very different than what i grew up in but also so um important to just like live in that culture day to day and i think that's probably been the most impacting thing is like being able to experience it on that level if you could summarize your experience working here so far in a few sentences, how would you do so? Um, working here has been um, just an incredible experience. I love that I get to like work with people um, and learn about my culture and just be outdoors every day. Um, and I think the team we have here as well is just really special. Um, we all bring really incredible gifts to the table um, and you know impact each other and push each other both in amazing like co-worker ways but also in amazing ways as individuals. So, so.
for those who don't know about Métis, what would you tell them about who the Métis are? Um, I guess just, you know, that like the Métis are Indigenous as well. Um, and it, we're often like left out of the history books, left out of the textbooks and conversations. Um, and kind of forgotten, but that's the reality is, is we're still here and we still have a lot to bring to the table as well. And we want to be, you know, in relationship with both our like European relatives and our First Nations relatives. It's really important to us um, and to be able to build those relationships um, and like grow in strength as a nation as well. Um, and so, you know, we really appreciate people who come to the table and like listen openly and ask open questions. And I think that's one of the reasons I love this job so much as well is because it, it's a space for people to like learn and actually ask these questions about Métis from an authentic source. And so I think that um, having people out there who want to ask those questions, um, like just ask them. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. I'm Sarah Jordan, I'm Cree, uh, and I've been full-time with Mohican Trails for about three years. I got my start with Mohican Trails and then moved on to uh, uh, other uh, larger uh, organizations where um, yeah, it was a lot more of a, um, sometimes it was kind of smaller groups, intimate back and forth, but more often than not, it was um, uh, large presentations, which at first, um, when I landed a job that involved me up, standing up on a stage, giving out interpretive cultural information to groups of like around 100 people, I was terrified. Um, so first thing I tried to do was uh, just walk up and start random awkward uh, conversations with strangers. Uh, and then it moved from me kind of hiding behind the podium with my script to, um, you know, getting so used to it that just being in front of the crowd has uh, become natural to me. Uh, so I've taken a, a lot of that back or a, a lot of that experience and brought it into Mohican Trails. So I'm dealing with these groups and it's both a performance and a conversation. The more confident you become with that, with the material, like if you're running off a script, whether it's been given to you or it's one that you've created yourself, you do it so many times that it just kind of goes on autopilot. Like now words come out of my mouth and no thought goes into my brain beforehand, it just flows. <laughs> For any non-indigenous, who have never heard of the Mexican Trails, what would you tell them about it? Um, I mean, the, the tours are great, uh, myself and the other guides, and it gives people a, a chance to, uh, to, to learn um, about uh, indigenous cultures, especially um, when we get like the, the international market, right? A lot of uh, uh, Canadians will know more uh, about uh, some of the indigenous cultures, not, perhaps not as much as they should, uh, but I think with the international um, groups, it gives us like a, a really great uh, opportunity uh, to kind of get rid of like some stereotypes and, and get them to learn more. Um, like I've never actually found anybody with any sort of uh, like hate, but we get a lot of ignorance, right? I have people say like, you know, using the word Indian, which is of course, if they're from uh, another country, and that's what they learned in their school system, right? Uh, there's, I, you know, bear no ill will uh, towards somebody like that, but if they can actually talk to us and learn, uh, and maybe bring that back home with them. So have a, like that, typically bring an open mind? Yeah. That's good. If you could summarize your experience overall with the Deacon Trails, how would you do so? Um, well, when we're doing uh, like the guided walks, and great work-life balance, right? Uh, I can make a, a decent living off of working an hour and a half a day. Um, and yeah, I get to uh, travel to uh, different parts of Western Canada and meet all sorts of interesting people from all over the world. What's been your biggest lesson so far working here? Um, my biggest lesson working here, um, I think it's, one of the things with the, the international groups is learning how to communicate uh, across language barriers, right? Finding ways that, of course, we'll, we'll get translated into some groups, but some things don't translate from English into other languages. So learning to find new ways to communicate information without being able to uh, say it. How do you find the Mexican Trails have grown from the 16 to now? 
Um, it's a huge change. Um, it's it's evolved so much. It's done a complete uh, kind of 180. Um, so yeah, it used to just be about the, the, the outdoor adventure and just like, you know, going up mountains and that, but now it's more about just these short walks where we uh, connect people with the land. How has your cultural identity grown since you working here? Um, I've definitely learned more, um, especially through my mom, but also with other organizations I've worked with, uh, having to do my own uh, reading and research, and uh, yeah, just looking through the history and culture that way. So this uh, dust that I got off the tree, first of all, this is a trembling aspen. And as we look around, you can see further in the forest, uh, there's other trembling aspens. Um, so in this area, as we look through the forest and see the trees similar to this, how many aspens would you say that we have? Oh man, a whole bunch. One, maybe two. So the trembling aspen, what it does is as it grows, its root system spreads and it clones itself. Um, and so the root systems go very, very deep. And uh, that's actually its defense mechanism against forest fires. So when a fire comes through, it'll burn down the trunks, but the root system is still alive. And it's one of the first things we'll see coming back after a fire. But that dust uh, that I got off the tree bark here, uh, that grows on the tree, it protects it from the sun, uh, we can use the sunscreen as well, although it's not very good. It only has a sun protection factor of about 15 and needs to be frequently reapplied. Uh, but I've got a better use for it. Uh, this dust is also a natural type of yeast. So we do have kind of everything that we need growing in the area to make bread. Now, some areas we won't find all of the plants together. We can use it as a type of yeast. And if you're making something uh, like a, a, a live culture yeast, so, of course, if you bake it into bread, it's going to kill off the yeast. But in something like a, a, a beer or anything like that, where we keep the culture alive, it's really good for you uh, after a run of antibiotics uh, because it promotes the regrowth of the good bacteria that the antibiotics kill off. Um, now, this tree is a member of the, uh, the willow family. Uh, so the inner bark of this tree has a chemical in it called uh, populin, which is very similar to a chemical called spirin which is what we find in aspirin. So it has some natural pain relieving abilities. But another thing uh, that people don't quite understand uh, about plants is they talk to each other. So I mentioned the, the aspen there uh, in these areas, they're um, all connected by the root system. But when you've got different groves uh, of aspen, they can communicate with one another. So uh, if one trembling aspen tree gets a, an infestation of tent caterpillars, they'll actually drop their leaves uh, to remove the food source. The, the leaves can remain off for up to two years. They can still photosynthesize through the bark, uh, not as well as through the leaves, but good enough. But when that happens, when it drops its leaves, it will release a pheromone into the air that tells all of the other aspen to drop their leaves before they even get infested in the first place. But uh, let's move on, see what else we have in here. Uh, here we have buffalo berry. And this is a very important plant. Um, now there's no berries on this, but uh, if we see the berries, um, they're, they're about the size of a pea and they're bright red or bright orange. But the fact that there's no berries on this tells me one of three things. Uh, one, we could be having a bad season for buffalo berries in the area. Two, it could be a male plant because only the female plants uh, produce berries. Or three, we have a bear in the area and that's why we don't have any berries. So a lot of people associate the, uh, the bears with uh, eating salmon, but we are east of the continental divide. So all the rivers here lead out to either the Arctic or the Atlantic. Um, and for the bears to put on enough weight to survive the winter, uh, every day each bear needs to eat around 250,000 buffalo berries. So uh, this time of year during berry season is when the bears are at their most dangerous because they're so focused on the berries that they're really not paying attention to anything else. And that's when it's easy to uh, get too close and surprise a bear. So the reason that this is so is such an important plant is because it is the main food source of the bears. So uh, parks will do uh, studies um, and they will actually count the berries that the bears are eating. But they don't count them on the way into the bear. They will count them after they leave the bear. 
So there are teams that are sent to various locations, um, and a lot of the bears have tracking collars, and they're assigned a bear to follow. And it is their job to work in shifts around the clock, following that bear during berry season, picking up bear poop, and getting the seeds counted. Uh, and the reason they do that is because bears are one of the animals at the top of the food chain. So if there's something wrong with them, it means there's something wrong with the ecosystem as a whole. And um, if in an area it's determined that there isn't enough food for the bears, um, what we do to intervene, and this sounds crazy, is start a forest fire. So yeah, half of Canada is on fire right now. We've got these very dangerous, destructive wildfires. Uh, they are, um, you know, burning everything down. They're, they're destroying homes. They're displacing people. Uh, we've had, a, unfortunately, had a few fatalities with the people fighting these fires. But the reason that they're so bad is because of the prevention of forest fire in the past. So fire is actually a very important part to the life cycle of a forest. Um, so as a forest ages, what happens is uh, the evergreen trees and lodgepole pine uh, and the spruce start to take over and they grow faster than everything else. And when they eventually reach the top of the canopy, uh, they kill off everything else. So in an old forest, uh, this is a fairly young forest, so we've got a lot of diversity in the plant life. Um, <coughs> but uh, when those evergreens take over, and all these aspens and poplars and other trees around us start uh, dying off, they fall over. And the, the forest gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And these evergreen trees are also very flammable. So in, an, in a really old forest, you have almost no diversity uh, in plant life. And you've got a lot of fuel built up. So when an old forest burns, there's so much fuel built up that they burn very, very hot and they become very destructive. So around here, uh, we actually wanna see a fire about every 70 years, ideally. And those ones, those more frequent ones, as they go through, uh, there isn't as much fuel built up, so they aren't as destructive. And they'll clear out <coughs> some of the older growth. They'll take care of uh, diseases and parasites. And all the ashes and charcoal go into the soil and provide nutrients for the new plants that are growing. So in the 1980s, biologists in Banff National Park um, were out doing their studies and they noticed the animal population was getting less and less every year. They also noticed that the, the, the food supply for these animals was dwindling as well. So they consulted a bunch of the local indigenous groups and they asked them, has this happened in the past? What's going on here? What can we do about it? And uh, they were told, stop putting out forest fires. Let them happen. So, um, yeah, when the fire goes through, it's just kind of like the big reset button for the forest that we're in. Uh, for thousands of years, people moving through these areas were following migrating herds of animals. Those animals were their food. When the herd would move on, they would follow, and they wouldn't put out their campfires. And occasionally those fires would spread, burning older sections of forest, um, ensuring that next year there was a food supply for the animals that they depended on. But buffalo berry, um, even though it's the main food source for the bears, we don't call it bear berry, we call it buffalo berry. So we can eat buffalo berries. Um, bears and humans share an almost identical internal physiology. Uh, anything that uh, bears can eat, we can eat. And that's one reason that they're so important is it's very likely that a long time ago, people would have had an understanding of that relationship between bears and humans. So if you enter a new area, a different ecosystem that you're unfamiliar with, you can find bears and watch what they're eating when they're hungry or what they're eating when they're sick. Uh, but it's called buffalo berry because it was cooked and put on buffalo meat. Uh, when you uh, cook it, uh, the buffalo berries get very sweet. Now, I can actually pick them right off the plant and eat them raw. I don't know too many other people who can. They're very, very bitter when they're raw. But when you cook it, it becomes more palatable for most people. So we'd use that to season buffalo meat. Um, but even though we can eat them, they're also poisonous at the same time, which seems kind of strange. How does that work? Well, it has to do with how it enters your body. When you eat buffalo berry and it goes through your digestive system, it's just fine. Um, when, uh, if you get buffalo berry directly into a wound, directly into your bloodstream, that's when it becomes poisonous. So what it does is it thins your blood and prevents it from clotting. So it turns a minor wound into something a lot more serious. And if you get enough, you can even, even suffer an anaphylactic reaction. 
So another use for buffalo berry was actually to poison arrows, uh, to take animals down faster. Uh, because of that, it thins the blood, uh, and you could also get that uh, reaction. And also, if you um, uh, shoot an arrow at an animal, and you don't hit it in the spot that you want to, and the animal runs off, it leaves a much easier trail for you to follow. So edible and poisonous. Uh, and that's kind of an analogy for uh, the, this whole area, right? It can help you or it can hurt you. It all kind of depends on you. Quick question. If someone sees a bear like in this area, what, what should they do? Uh, what you should do uh, if you see a bear, if you encounter one, well, first of all, you want to be making a lot of noise uh, out on the trail. Uh, just so that bears know that you're coming. Uh, if you surprise a bear, uh, it can get defensive. <coughs> but um, uh, you want to keep a safe distance. Um, you want to uh, stay in a group. Everybody stays together. Get your bear spray prepared. Um, and again, you should uh, uh, do some research beforehand on how to deal with bear encounters. Uh, I could spend eight hours going over what to do because it's, it's all very situational. But uh, again, any uh, uh, bear sightings, you also want to report to Parks Canada and let them know uh, where you are um, and what kind of bear you've encountered, where it is. All right, so uh, here we have a uh, birch tree and we used to make a lot of things from this tree. So this bark, an example, it's uh, peeling. I'm not gonna peel it anymore. I'm just gonna let it kind of do its own thing. But uh, we got this kind of natural, almost like paper like consistency and on larger birch trees with thicker bark uh, the, the the bark is what we would have sewn together over um, canoe frames so this is what we made our canoes out of uh, also things like um, moose calls uh, for luring moose in when hunting uh, baskets all sorts of other uh, uh, projects but uh, another really good use for birch is there's a lot of oils in the bark uh, and those oils are quite flammable and they burn very very hot so even with the rain coming down like this if you were in a situation where you need to get a fire going you definitely want to uh, find a birch tree uh, to get it started so the provincial uh, flower of alberta you know the license plate wild rose country um so the one place in alberta that you will not find a wild rose is on the license plates they've got their own kind of rose on it it's a dog rose but close enough but the flowers are already gone for the season and the rose hips are starting to mature. And when they're ripe, uh, they'll turn a, a dark red color. Um, and at first they're flavorless, um, but when we get nights where it's dropping below zero, uh, that's when we get uh, like a, the good hard frost, it starts to sweeten up. And that's when we harvest them uh and then dry them up and grind them and it was a very common thing to put in uh, tea to make rosehip tea so it's quite sweet uh it was used in, used to sweeten things like a uh, pine needle tea um but it's very very important that we uh grind it up and make it into a tea and not eat the rose hips whole uh but if you're going to eat them you have to be really careful uh you need to get rid of the seeds when the seeds are ground up, they're fine. Um, now, they're not poisonous or anything, but if you eat a rosehip whole, uh, the seeds, uh, they're going to go down to your stomach, they're going to go through your digestive system. They're going to make it almost all the way out, but the seeds have uh, hairs on them that are kind of like Velcro, and they get stuck at the exit for a while. So I, I can't remember uh, what the Cree word is, but um, if somebody were to uh, eat one of those whole, we'd refer to it as an itchy bum berry. <laughs> and all over the place, these little three-leaf plants with these uh, red vines going between them. These are the, uh, the wild strawberries. Um, and the berries that come out of this are very, very small, uh, but they're, they've got way more flavor than the big ones that you get in the grocery store. Um, and then we can also use, uh, use the leaves as well. Uh, you can eat them uh, when they're fresh, uh, or you can pick them when they're fresh and dry them and use them later after they're dried. Uh, we don't want to be using any of the ones that are starting to, uh, to wilt. Uh, is when they start to wilt, uh, they um, start to produce uh, hydrocyanamide, which is uh, poisonous. Now, there isn't enough in just a, a handful of wilted leaves to really do any harm, 
uh, but your body doesn't really have a way to get rid of it. So if you're eating them all the time, eventually, uh, eventually it will build up to, to toxic levels uh, in the body and be, become problematic. But, uh, so the leaves, we usually make a tea out of them. Um, and uh, there's also a, a medicinal uh, use for these is in the water out here, we do have some pretty nasty microorganisms, right? You never know what's peed or pooed or died upstream. So if you drink uh, water from a wild source without filtering it and boiling it, it can make you quite ill. And um, the danger is if you've got, uh, you've taken any of those, uh, you drank that water without treating it and vomiting and diarrhea, the, the danger is dehydration. But with a strawberry leaf, and this one is fresh, it's not wilted, and take the leaf, chew on it. My mouth has just gone quite dry. So um, the strawberry leaf, it's drying out my mouth, and the mouth is the start of the what system? The digestive system, right? So it'll work through the entirety of the, the digestive system, and uh, it kind of gets rid of a bit of that excess liquid, and it also stops the spasming uh, in the bowels. Um, so uh, it, it slows down uh, uh, things like diarrhea um, and prevents further dehydration. Now, it doesn't work very quickly. Uh, you have to take it for uh, quite some time before it works, but when it kicks in, uh, it, the, um, uh, the effect lasts quite a long time. Whereas things like Imodium or Pepto-Bismol are like an instant fix, uh, but those things over extended usage of time are very, very bad for your digestive system. So this is much softer on your body than those things. Um, and it's most potent uh, in a tincture, which is uh, taking the plant and using a, a strong grain alcohol solution to, to leach the medicines out further. But those wouldn't have been traditional, right? Because we're looking at those kind of appearing in the, the Victorian era. And of course, uh, alcohol was never discovered here. So the remedy um, traditionally would have been a tea. So this right here, something you'll walk past every day, just uh, uh, a small weed growing out of the, uh, the sidewalk. Uh, but this is plantain, uh, not to be confused with the bananas. Uh, but uh, another uh, name for this is rattlesnake root. Um, and if you are covered in mosquito bites, or you've bumbled into a wasp nest, or even bitten by a prairie rattler in Alberta, um, then you want to find this plant, take the leaves, chew it up, and put it on the, the bites and stings, and it actually uh, draws the, the venom out. And this is a plant that grows almost worldwide, and an interesting fact I recently learned about it is in India, uh, it, when a mongoose is out hunting snakes and it gets bit by a venomous snake, uh, it will actually find the plantain and eat it uh, to, uh, to help it recover from the bite. Wow. And yeah. even these uh, stalks that are coming up, uh, they'll be going into seed later and uh, they'll turn black. Uh, and that's when you can harvest the seeds and you can actually grind them to make a, a type of flour that we could combine with the, the yeast and then water and then find a source of sugar for bread. What do you know about the Métis sash there? Not much. All right. So the Métis sash was a uh, clothing item that was uh, adopted from the French, Scottish, the Irish. They brought it over. Uh, nowadays, people think it's uh, just a clothing item or a cultural item. or uh, so Even nowadays, it does have spiritual meaning to some but back in the day, it was a Swiss Army knife. It was a tool that did it all. This one is quite a long one, so this is about a 12-foot sash. This is more closely what, like uh, originally what the Métis, the fur traders and the indigenous people would, would have had. Uh, whereas, like Bridget steps in here, this one's more of a uh, cultural, like today, like the uh, machine loomed. So, and then, can you guess any any uses for this back in the past, what it would have been used for? Not off the top of my no. head. All right, so I could probably talk for hours on just the uses for this thing, but it could be used as a rope, a really strong wool woven rope. 
tie the canoes, tie bundles together. It's also very important for the first aid aspect of, of the fur trade. So back in the past, one of them, yeah, the hernias were one of the number one deaths of the fur traders because you get, you're lifting the uh, 90 pound bundles. You were uh, expected to carry two at a time, if not three, and they were 90 pound bundles of fur. So one of the things that would prevent you getting a hernia from all that heavy lifting all day long for like 16 hours a day, you'd wrap this around your waist extremely tight, tie it, and it would be used as a back brace. Then, if you like broke a bone or something, it'd be used as a splint. And another real important use that the Métis Sash had was a tump line. So what a tump line is, so it was the method to uh, lift the bundles. So tump line, they wrap this around their forehead and then this end of it would be attached to your bundles and it would be a much more effective way of carrying the bundles than just with your hands. Because you could stack three at a time on your back like this and carry it through the bush. Oh, this would be almost like tied. Yeah. Oh. In the same way that you see a lot of like the, the Nepalese, like Sherpas and stuff, use, use their ropes in their sashes for what they do for carrying all that heavy weight up the mountain still. And of course nowadays, don't have real much use for the practical side of the sash, but what it is still there for is the cultural, spiritual, and the uh, individual identity of the Métis. Because each pattern would have meant something. So this one would be the uh, Coventry sash. So this is the one that was uh, that Louis Riala wore, same pattern. And other different families have their own patterns, kind of got adopted from like the Scottish tartan kind of deal with the clan system. So you use it as an identifier, whether by family or by company that you work for. And yeah, just a thousand different uses for this thing. When did you receive this one? This one I uh, got on my own, but I have been gifted sashes. They just, all the ceremonial sashes, they just don't fit me. So I keep those for uh, like decoration and uh, as keepsakes, but I had to get myself a proper working sash. <laughs> do you use any of the practical aspects? I do. I have you worn this hunting and uh, used it like in the folds when I do put it on. I can carry like bullets, tools, carry my knife in the sash when I just, just don't have any pockets or in the like the snowsuit. It's just impractical to try and dig, dig down under the layers and grab stuff. And I... I have pulled deer out of the bush with sashes like this before too. So, they're very practical still. It just kind of, that's been kind of lost on a lot of people. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. That's so cool. Okay, so, um, what I have here is I actually have an example of Métis beadwork. Um, so, a lot of First Nations do beadwork as well and it's something that we kind of um, adopted from our First Nations side. But the way we do beadwork and the way they do beadwork are quite different. Um, so the Métis are known as the flower beadwork people. And so what they did is they actually kind of adopted sort of the flower um, French embroidery that they had learned. Um, and they kind of applied that to the beadwork. So most of our beadwork is all flower and pattern designs. But there's a bit more to it than just that. Um, because the, the beadwork itself and the plants that they would feed um, had a purpose and had teachings in mind. Um, so they would actually often do beadwork during the winter time um, as a way of helping to remember what plants were in the area and as a way of teaching um, and remembering the medicinal uses for those plants. Uh, so the beadwork for the Métis people will change from region to region depending what plant life is available in that area. And um, with that, it was a way that they could, they could remember the medicines and pass those down during the winter time as well. Um, it's also known, the Métis are also known as the peacocks of the prairie because um, most of the time their clothing, especially their jackets and such, would be very beautifully beaded and they would cover entire pieces of clothing in the beadwork, which was a bit of a different style compared to a lot of the First Nations 
um, who would often have more um, simplistic or single pieces of beadwork along their jackets as opposed to covering the whole piece of clothing in beadwork. Um, and so it's quite identifiable um, from, from the other forms of indigenous beadwork that exist as well. So, How long have you had this for? Um, so this is actually, um, the beadwork on this actually came off of um, a pair of moccasins that were handed down to my family. Um, so this is actually like the vamp of, of the moccasin. Um, but my grandmother, my cookum, she had um, she had these moccasins still, and obviously like the, the leather on the um, moccasins was all worn out. Um, so she had the beadwork taken off and put on a, a bag for me as a as a graduation present. So, oh wow, that's special. Yeah. Do you bead yourself? I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing now? Well, for me, I think they'd be very proud. Uh, my ancestors were uh, fur traders, hunters, and they did pretty much, they relied on all that work, so probably bring pride that that work is still around in some way or fashion today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd say mine would be proud that uh, we're uh, uh, re relearning the traditions and passing them on, keeping them alive. Um, I think for myself, uh, I often think about, um, my great grandfather who left Manitoba, um, because there's still a lot of unhealed things in my family, um, especially for the men in my family with, um, sort of the shame around being Métis and what it looks like to openly practice that. Um, but the more that I have, um, like followed this path and pursued this path, the more um, I just feel his closeness to me, um, and in fact, like, just changing even, like, kind of jobs to coming to work full-time for Brenda here this summer, um, what the land offers here, being, it being a wetland out here, my great-grandfather grew up in Okamak, which is a, a wetland swamp in Manitoba, um, and I actually had a, a couple moments this summer, um, one in particular, I, Jay and I went out on the, just on the raft on the pond, um, and I was walking barefoot through sort of the swampy, wet mud and grass. Um, and all of a sudden, it didn't feel like I was walking there anymore. It felt like somebody had walked there before me. Um, and so just, I think for me, it's not what they would say so much as just moments when I feel that I'm walking on the path that they have laid out, laid out for me. So. Thank you for sharing. Oh, one year or two, three, we, we debate the date too. One year, five days later, we, we got married. I retired from the army, gave up a promising career. Um, and then, yeah, then immigrated over here. And that was 30 years ago. Yeah, 30 years ago we got married. 31 years ago we met. That's quite the long story. <laughs> Hi, my name's Dave Holder, and uh, I've been in Canada 29 years, I married Brenda 30 years ago, and my background was in the British Army, where I was actually a combat engineer, but I also taught mountaineering skills within a special unit within the British Army. When I immigrated over here, for the first eight years, I, I taught the British Army as a civilian instructor, uh, teaching various mountain skills. Brenda and I started to formulate where we would like to go together in the future. So we, we set up our own outdoor company and we went through a number of names for the company and we, we ended up with, uh, with Mahican, a wolf, uh, because it is her spirit animal within the Cree world and her indigenous background. Over the years, we, we've moved forward um, as guides. Uh, I, I am a guide with the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides, with Wilderness Guide Association out of Europe. And I'm a master guide with the Interpretive Guiding Association, instructor with the Outdoor Council of Canada. So I'm heavily involved within the guiding world itself. Also, uh, I had a great background within the world of survival. And a lot of that stems from the military, because in the military, wherever we would go around the world, they would they would make sure that we worked with the local indigenous people who were in those countries. So in Africa, I worked with the Kikuyu tribe with um, the 
base in Mount Kenya and I was taught jungle training, uh, jungle training skills with, with some of the elders from, from that tribe. Uh, when I was in Central America, I worked with the Mayan people and we learned survival skills with, with those people. And I always hate calling it survival skills because in actual fact, we were learning living skills, everyday living skills and crafts uh, that, that one can use to, to live in, in the wilderness. And I think perhaps it's a great fault of, of the world when we have a look at survival, people get wrapped up in looking at these special forces soldiers running around the world, um, being the heroes of, of the outdoor industry, when, it, when in fact it's probably a, a grandmother from the Cree tribe who has more skills than that particular special forces soldier. And it, it's something that I've learned uh, along the way, uh, more so since I've, I've come to Canada and worked with indigenous people here which has encompassed a, a lot of groups within Canada, so Inuit, uh, Inuvialuit, Dene, uh, Wichon, Cree, Blackfoot, Stoney, Sutina, Honeycutine, um, and Quatsino people on the West Coast. And from all of those, those indigenous groups, I've learned some, some marvelous skills about everyday living, um, some crafting skills, how to make things when, when I'm living and traveling out in, in the wilderness. And so what I try and do is encompass all of those skills that I've learned from indigenous people in this country and indigenous people around the world to formulate courses and skills that we can pass on within our courses. Also along the way, <clears throat> Brenda is, is a great herbalist and knowledge keeper of medicinal plants within the Cree world. And so she has, has ensured that I firmly followed in her footsteps and learned about the plants over here. And now I'm becoming a herbalist. So I'm the junior herbalist in the family now. I'm studying under Brenda and, and learning as much as I can about the plants, which is, which is a wonderful thing to do because I, I can certainly pass on some in-depth information about the plants that, that I come across here in the forest. Wow, so you really have been all over, eh? Yeah. How have you been received by these various indigenous groups? When I look back at all the indigenous groups that I've worked with, uh, they've, they've received me really well. Um, and I think it's because um, the education that I got at an early age, to be humble, um, to, to respect um, other cultures around the world, and Whenever I've met a culture from around the, around the world, I've, I've, I have been humble and willing to listen. And I think if you're willing to listen to the people there, um, they'll teach you a hell of a lot. And if, if you go in you know, with, with too much arrogance, too much confidence, you overwhelm some of those quiet, gentle people that you meet in these locations around the world. Um, and they don't want to give you information. Um, on, I work on it on the own show, the history on the, on the History Channel, and so um, normally, if we're going to go to a foreign country, uh, I'm sent across a little bit earlier to work with the indigenous people in that location. Uh, in Mongolia, for instance, I've, I've been sent over to Ulaanbaatar. And I, I worked in the University of Ulaanbaatar there for a couple of weeks with a professor who introduced me to some, some local shamans and just local people where I actually learnt about medicinal uses and the spiritual practices of, of those people there that I could then impart to the cast members on the show when they came across to survive. In Patagonia I spent time with the gauchos which are, which are the cowboys of Patagonia and I was with this elder there we, we would go for long walks in the forest. I couldn't speak Spanish and uh, he, he can't speak English or couldn't speak English so, so we just pointed at plants and figured out which ones are edible, which ones weren't. So, yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been a great journey. How can other non-Indigenous better hold space for Indigenous in this line of work? I think people coming into this line of work should, should, should really uh, respect those who, who've gone before us within this country. Uh, I look at the Indigenous learnings of this country and 
look at the, the people who, the indigenous folks who are alive today, that they're so close to their roots, they're so close to these ancient practices that, that were practiced um, for thousands and thousands of years. In Europe, we're a little bit further away, but we still have this, this ancient knowledge, this ancient culture, and many people from Europe want to experience that, They're trying to get back to their roots. They don't know how to, but they, they'd like to get back to their roots a little bit more, especially in these days of modern medicine, medicine where people are losing faith within the world of modern medicine, and they're looking back to, to, to their, their, their herbalist past, uh, what ancient practices were, were practiced long, long ago. Uh, and now people are realizing that over here, uh, generally in Canada, in Canada, more than the whole of North America, there's this, there's this tie, there's this, this close relationship that people have with their roots that can be taught to tourists when they come across here. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. Thank you. Um, so, how has it been, you know, to grow with Brenda both in a business aspect but also as a life partner? I've got the perfect life partner, life partner so <laughs> that is the nice thing. Um, we've, we've really moved from, from quite a, a technical side of, of guiding, and we were heavily involved in, in guiding people around the mountains, um, rock climbing, um, guiding people in caves underground, so there's a lot of rope work, rope technical work, um, and we taught a lot of rescue subjects such as wilderness first aid, which we still teach. But we've progressed more to the, the spiritual side, I think, within our business. And we've realized that there is this craving around the world for, for to return to these indigenous roots that everybody has. And so Brenda and I have naturally catered towards that because it's an area that we love. We, we, we love being independent, being able to make our own medicines, um, use the uh, land around us uh, to, to get our own food from. What's been uh, the biggest lesson that you've taken away from all these experiences? I think the biggest lesson that, that I've learned from all of my experiences is that we move through chapters in our life. And one thing I always tell people is you're never too old till you're dead. So I think a lot of people uh, make excuses so that they, that they have an excuse not to move on in life. They, that they seem to reach a point in their life saying, I'm too old to do something. But for Brenda and I, we, we are aging. Um, I'm aging. But we're constantly looking at these new chapters in our life that excite us and, and want us to move on too. We, we, we talk about retiring. Hell, I should be retired now. But uh, we, we feel this, this, this draw to stay in this business because we feel that we're offering something to people um, that they can't get anywhere else in the world. And um, I suppose the lesson in life is, 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 to, is to keep going. Really. Thank you. Now if you could summarize your experience with the uh, Hikiki Trails for now, how would you do so? I think to summarize my experience with Mahican Trails, is that uh, you know having Brenda there with me? It's 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 been an exciting adventure, and uh, the adventure has not finished yet. I expect more adventure in the future. Now, for anyone looking to get into the producing industry, what advice would you give? Oh, looking at the. the the world of producing and TV. It's, it's strange how I fell into it. it. Brenda had some TV shows. She had a TV show of her own on uh, Aboriginal People TV Network. And, and then I was called in as, as a fixer and safety guy. And I also did a little bit of survival um, consulting on that show. And then from that, uh, it moved on to other shows where I was called in as a survival consultant or um, safety consultant, living skills consultant. And so I was called up by the, uh, by the people who make the alum show for, for the season one. 
and uh, I went and auditioned for the show. I didn't get on, and I couldn't figure out why I didn't get through this audition, and we had to go through a big boot camp and everything. And I couldn't figure out why they didn't want me on that first show. Uh, they called me for the second show and said, hey Dave, do you, want, do you want to come on the show? I said, well, you didn't want me last time. And they said, no, we want you on the survival consultant team. And they said, yeah, we thought you were too good for the show last time. I learned this story last year, actually, from, from the main producer of the show, which is, which is quite flattering, really. But uh, I pegged it. <laughs> and I was so, I was, in, in my stage of depression, I couldn't believe that they actually wanted me back. So, so yeah, anyway, I joined season two for the show, and I've been with them ever since. And uh, over the past four years, they, they promoted me from survival consultant to producer. So within the world of production, I've helped with these spin-off shows that they've uh, put together and worked with other producers and we put storylines together, uh, story content. And um, I've learned now to work a lot more with cameras and what cameras can do. Not that I can operate them very well, but I can realize that uh, what, what should be done for various aspects of, of the camera world when, when filming. Uh, I suppose that's another part of my life that I never expected to get into, but, but once, once it was offered to me, I, I leapt into the role and, and, I'm, and I'm enjoying it as it moves forward. And that's taken me around the world. I mean, two months ago, I was in South Africa. We were working there on, um, on a prospective show for the next year. So, yeah, it's, it's part of that never give up, it's part of that um, embrace, embrace um, new challenges in life and, and keep moving forward. Thank you for sharing so much. Tansay Nitsi Harrison Brenda, Nina Tanti Orochi Sunri, but originally from Jasper National Park. And um, I am the owner and main operator of my company, Mahican Trails. Uh, Mahican is a very important uh, uh, animal in, uh, uh, in my culture for me, personally. Uh, Mahican is the wolf, and uh, it's, uh, um, it's a beautiful animal that was uh, um, shared with me by, uh, by a couple of different elders, and I, uh, I decided that uh, it was a great name for a company. When did you found the company? I originally started the company um, actually back in 1995 uh, under a different iteration, different names, uh, along with my husband. Um, we were working with the British military and at the time they uh, um, had requested us uh, to um, create a company in order to continue working there so we could contract through them because they didn't have us on as employees so we contracted. When you first started, did you see that it was growing this much? When I first started the company, I, I really did not anticipate the growth that it would have. And in fact, um, back then in my mind, it was really going to just be able to continue uh, working with the British military. Yeah, I really was expecting that we would simply continue to work with the British military only and, uh, and that um, it wouldn't go any farther than that. Um, but as all things in big organizations change, uh, their needs changed and we had to um, change our focus but also at the same time I began to really recognize that the knowledge that I had was something that might be interesting to, to tourists in general. What sort of packages do you offer now? We've really simplified a lot of what we do. Um, over the years we, uh, we did a lot of different things but we began to recognize that um, really for our own sanity, but also to really get more in-depth cultural teachings, we had to simplify what we did and really come back to the land. And so the packages that we offer are, um, are medicine walks at the simplest level and um, things that are a little bit more um, comprehensive. Um, we do hands-on workshops where people can actually work with the medicines. But we also teach traditional land-based skills to um, what people now, I guess, would call survival and bushcraft and stuff. Um, we also um, instruct first aid, uh, advanced wilderness first aid. We teach guiding courses. So we have a variety of different packages, sort of 
One side is the consulting side, and then on the other side is more the traditional side. What does a medicine walk entail? Medicine walks are really beautiful. Um, we, it really starts with um, us talking a bit about our culture and um, getting to know our clients a little bit and having a quick little circle. We always do a tobacco offering and share some of the teachings behind that. And, um, and then we really like to collect knowledge from the group. So to find out uh, what is their level of knowledge of understanding the plants that are found in the, uh, in the forest. Uh, because it's a fun way to help people also contribute to, the, to their own teachings. So, um, so it'll be a little bit of that. And then we also like to reach out to the familiar. For example, I'll ask people if they um, know where bread came from, and sometimes I'll play with them a little bit, but I will always tell them that the ingredients to make bread are all found in the forest. Flour, yeast, sugar, salt, water, it's all in the forest uh, that, that we walk into. Um, and then we'll focus on anywhere from five to 10 plants. Uh, that are used as a traditional type of medicine. Um, we offer a cup of tea in the forest uh, that we will have picked out on the, our, our property. Um, and it's really just a way to get people to understand that maybe when they go back home as well, they might have a different respect for their land because it doesn't matter where people come from in the world. For the most part, we can often show them at least one plant that they will find back home in their own country. Wow, I bet you get a lot of crazy reactions. It's interesting. We'll get uh, things from uh, people who maybe they have a background in botany who know an awful lot um, will often say, I didn't know that about this plant or I was unaware, um, all the way to people just in, in absolute tears because it touches them in such a deep way. And, uh, and I have to say that it's, it's their their journey. It's not that I've necessarily had anything to do with it. It's maybe um, myself or one of my guides has, has shown them something that resonates really deeply with them. And, uh, and sometimes the, uh, the floodgates of the teachings come through their eyes in the form of tears. Thank you for sharing. What sort of winter options do you offer? Our winter options are really quite incredible. We, um, we do snowshoe tours and of course we offer winter medicine walks. Medicine walks are done year round. Um, this last year we really got more in depth in terms of what we wanted to offer as a package and um, I was sitting uh, in a restaurant in Edmonton with my sister and we were looking down at the, uh, it was in November, and we were looking down at these, uh, the pods, you know, the clear sky pods with uh, at a restaurant where people could go and eat their meals, and I thought, we could do that. We could do that on, on, on the property, and so we actually set up a trapper's tent. We covered it in poly and these beautiful, like, blue Christmas lights that we add inside, um, and we, uh, we combined it with another program that I developed called The Sense of Snow, um, and The Sense of Snow came from realizing that you know, other tour operators were really wondering, how do we increase winter product? And, and I casually said to a, f a friend of mine at this meeting that, well, it's just that they don't understand the sense of snow the way that we do uh, as indigenous people and how that's really part of the land. And his jaw kind of dropped. And from there, I thought, well, gee, maybe I better develop this sense of snow and, and help the understanding of what snow really means to us as well and how important it is on the landscape and the teachings of snow. And so I developed the sense of snow, but I combined it with doing this trackers tent. And in it, we, um, we do the, some of the winter teachings of tree medicine and, uh, and the teachings of snow itself and, uh, and walk on the land and have quiet moments in the forest. And then um, by the time we get around um, the land, we come up to the trackers tent, which is fully lit up and we have candles in the snow to create a pathway and they get a really hot meal and they get more teachings about the traditional wooden snowshoes and various other things that we share about winter. And then we do some night sky stories and anything that we can offer the people to help them to connect to the winter snowscape, so to speak. And we, um, I really love the, uh, the winter product. How have they been received by uh, clients? 
Well, so far we've uh, just run two, um, two pilots with um, some very prominent people in the industry. None of them were Indigenous, but they're very prominent in the industry, and they absolutely loved it. So we knew that we were really on the right track. And so we're excited to uh, start that November 15th this year. We'll be kicking off officially for, uh, for regular clients. How excited are you? I am super pumped about it. I know it's going to be really well received. That's awesome. Uh, on a different note, for those who don't know, what are traditional medicines? I'm always very careful when I talk about traditional medicines because there's just, um, there's, there's so much more to it um, in terms of um, how I approach it uh, with clients um, and I really focus very much on the, uh, the physical aspect of medicines and talking about their specific traditional uses. So when we go out onto the land, I like to introduce people to, um, to medicines that not only are fairly safe and fairly simple, but it is understanding how our relationship with the standing people, which are the plants, really formed us as human beings, but also um, it was in, in my culture, it was part of my formative years with my grandmother, and really utilizing the plant medicine as such a deep connection to the land, and also to understand my place in the land um, and uh, as, as part of a relationship with uh, with the standing people, with the plants, but also to recognize that these gifts that are that are shared with us are to be respected at the highest level we possibly can, and also understanding in relationship that every plant out there carries my DNA, and I carry the DNA of every plant. And everything that touches me, from the wind to the sun, the ground, we interchange our DNA. We're always part of each other, um, and that's been really driven into. I guess into my mind by my grandmother, by my mother, and to understand that um, these medicines are uh, are such an important thing. It's hard for me to even really articulate um, what that uh, what that um, actually means to me. But the way I think about it is, you know, now land acknowledgments are such a huge part of um, the Canadian um, introductions um, at big events and conferences and things like that, but nobody really seems to have a huge understanding of that. And basically, my mother always said to me, without land, you have nothing. Without these medicines, you, we have nothing. Everything that we are and everything that we have is, is because of that. And, um, and I follow that up now saying, if we didn't have land, really, we'd be all kind of awkwardy awkwardly looking at each other as we float in space, not really knowing what to do. But because the land um, provides these very powerful gifts of medicines, um, it's something that we have to recognize that without them, we're also nothing. We have nothing. We couldn't eat, we couldn't get well, and we couldn't communicate properly. Thank you. What protocols should people be aware of before booking a medicine walk? Well, the protocols that, um, that were uh, taught to me is, are that um, tobacco is very important to, to offer. Um, and, but we're very aware that many of our international guests do not know that. And so, of course, we bring tobacco to the land so we can make the offerings. But it, it is appropriate to offer uh, a gift of tobacco to a knowledge keeper like myself when we're, sh when we're sharing knowledge. Um, but some of the other things too that are that are important, um, and you know we have to be very soft and forgiving because again, people just don't really know better, um, and I, I think it's more specific to Bridget and myself, um, where um, people will want to touch our hair, they'll want to touch our skirts, and and they really shouldn't do that. Um, maybe they should uh, ask permission first and then we can actually educate people that it's probably not appropriate to, to just reach out and start touching us. Um, so um, those, those are some of the important ones. I think the other piece to it is to, um, to really try and open themselves up to the understandings of the importance of the, the, the land and the plants in the way that we do to maybe be open-minded is really important. Thank you.
Now, if you could summarize your overall experience uh, with the Nihiki Trails, how would you do so? My overall experience um, with Mahican Trails is that without ever really knowing from the very beginning that this would be um, a life fulfilling process for me, that I never ever expected it to be. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never expected to be an entrepreneur. But there was a part of me that always sought it out because I never wanted to work for anybody else. <laughs> and so I had to create my own job. Well, do you have any advice for other women looking to become entrepreneurs? Absolutely. I think the most important thing is it doesn't matter where you are in your journey. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter whether you know a lot about your culture or not. None of those things matter. I think what matters is to know, first of all, that you have gifts to bring to the table that are probably far more critical than you might ever imagine. And the second part of that is believe in yourself. Always believe in yourself. And I don't want that to sound, you know, like sort of blasé or, or trite, because everybody says believe in yourself. But I think if you really pull from the roots of who you are, especially as a woman, especially as you know the, the role that, that we have traditionally as you know the the nurturers and, and you know the, the bringers of life, that's no small feat. And to to always remember that you know creator gave you the ability to be a bringer of life. And that is such a huge responsibility that you do have some gifts to share, uh, regardless of what you do in business. And so, because Creator believes in you and the strength that you have to be a life bearer, that you also should believe in yourself too. Beautiful. To uh, build on that, how would you like to see your business grow in the next five years, in the next 10 years? I think in the next five years, I would really love to see more expansions on the, uh, the multiple day workshops that we do and getting more youth involved like Bridget and Jay to help them open up their gifts a lot more and to contribute to the overall success of the company. Um, in the next 10 years, uh, I'd like to kick myself out of the company altogether and boot Jordan into the seat <laughs> and, and just watch it grow in a different way and, and see, where, see where he takes it. What would you like non-ambitious to know about your business? What would I like non-Indigenous people to know about my business? Well, first of all, that we're friendly and we're open for business and that what we have created is for the benefit of all people. You don't have to be an Indigenous person to come and join us on a medicine walk or join one of our workshops. That uh, we, we welcome everybody and we really want you to come and learn from our culture. Um, we have a few different perspectives, of course. We've got both the Métis perspective and First Nations, so there's a lot for people to take in. How can non-Indigenous better hold space for your business? For non-Indigenous people to hold better space for our business, I think that there's, uh, there's several aspects to that. One is definitely to approach us and, and to uh, you know, come and, and learn from us. You know, we talk about often the difference between you know, what is cultural appropriation, what is cultural appreciation. And I won't go so much into the appropriation side of it, but cultural appreciation is going to indigenous businesses and taking part, you know, buying indigenous art from an indigenous artist, um, taking an actual tour from an indigenous operator rather than somebody that's operating a themed indigenous um, uh, experience. Um, and, and that's really where they can hold space for us, is to go directly to the source and, and learn from us. So I have various roles um, within the tourism industry that um, I sort of fell into accidentally the first one, um, and that was uh, 
I became a board member um, in the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. I believe it was in 2017 when I, I did that. And it was because um, somebody that was from Alberta um, stepped out of her place and, um, and, uh, and I, I stepped in. And uh, gosh, it was about four months later at our AGM, I, I became chair of the organization. And uh, that was a huge responsibility and beyond scary for me. I'd never been a board member before really. And, um, but because of the amazing staff that they have there, I had all kinds of amazing uh, subject matter experts that uh, helped me along the way to really grow into the, into the role. And as I did, I began to understand how very important um, the role that I had was. I knew that the association itself was critical for many of us across the country um, because you know we just didn't have the, the type of resources that we required or even the support that we needed uh, from an Indigenous perspective. And, uh, and so being in that role, I was chair for five or six years, I believe. Um, last year, I stepped from chair, I stepped down to vice chair. Number one, to put some fresh blood in place, but also to, to give myself a little bit of a break because at the same time, not long after, I also became the chair of Indigenous Tourism Alberta, which is a role I still hold. And uh, I'm extremely happy to, to be able to do that, to fulfill uh, more duties here specifically in the province. Um, and we're highly aligned with the national board. And then I very recently, almost a year ago, uh, became a board member of uh, Destination Canada, which is uh, a real honor to be able to serve the country as a whole. How important is it to have an Indigenous voice the Destination of Canada? I think having an Indigenous voice at Destination Canada is really critical because it does help to, uh, to create some, uh, some understanding um, within a group of people who are doing a tremendous job across the country um, who might not otherwise have understood um, many of the challenges that happen within Indigenous communities or uh, Indigenous people that are not in communities. Um, to, uh, to bring some understanding and light to the table. So it can help uh, our team at Destination Canada do uh, an even better job. Awesome. Do you have any advice for Indigenous who are looking to get into the tourism business? I think that as many Indigenous people as possible should really get into the tourism business. And there's so many benefits behind it because number one, it really helps to reconnect youth and elders, which I think is super important. It's a great way for youth to reinstill extreme amounts of pride in who they are. Far too often we think about ourselves in, uh, you know, in a way that may not necessarily have people, you know, from our own perspective thinking that we, you know, we all know that we play an important role in our communities, but sometimes we underestimate the role that we play in this country as a whole in how we can approach um, an educational perspective with other Canadians and also our international guests. And tourism is a tremendous way for us to be able to do that, to showcase to the world, literally, who we are and, and why we are such an important, um, we have, such an important place in this country. Um, everything from the history to, to current events um, and, um, and how we can really grow that and how we can assist our communities to do better um, from an economic standpoint as well. And, um, you know, and, and just really continue on um, within our communities of supporting, not just on a financial perspective, but you know, maybe also our own journeys about who we are um, on this land. What do you think your ancestors would say if they could see the work you're doing now? I actually think um, my ancestors, I often feel them around me all the time. And I really believe that they are the ones that are really championing what I do. 
and I feel their guidance. And although I live in a very different time from when they did, I, I kind of go back to thinking about when life really changed for them. Uh, because it did, it changed a lot um, along the, uh, the timeline of, uh, of family members, my ancestors. But I've, it's my belief that they would probably say, uh, Miyasin, it's good, Miyasin. Uh, I feel that there's a lot of pride in how we, as their, their future generations, are moving forward in a very different world and still really holding on to those cultural beliefs and values. I think that's what they would say. How has it been to pass that on to your son? It's been very important to me to be able to pass that on to him. And I think more importantly, the fact that he's so willing to receive those teachings. And how has this business cemented your cultural identity? It's been amazing. It's been quite a journey. Um, you know, when, when I was born and raised, um, we were, we always knew we were indigenous people. And my grandmother gave us many of the traditional teachings. We lost all our stories and our songs. And, but we kept the land-based teachings very strongly. That was really ingrained in us. And um, I believe it was in 1993 that I found out that I not only had a First Nations lineage, but I had a, Mi a Métis lineage too. And so we became part of Métis Nation of Alberta. And um, I began to learn um, in later years what that meant and, and who, who we were as, as Métis people as well. And then just recently we um, uh, got our First Nation status back. But you know, I'm still very, very proud of the, the Métis lineage that I have uh, because it was, to me, it was hard won. It was very hard won, and I have such a soft spot and connection to that part of my lineage uh, because it's it's such a vibrant and beautiful culture, and there were many teachings that, I guess, in a way, sort of surprised me about you know the resilience and the, the history and um, just the cohesiveness and utter strength of a group of people that. Um, really are such a strong part of this country and the formative part of this country in a very different way. And um, so for me to now be able to have my First Nations status back, I think my company has made it totally okay for me to embrace both sides of that nature, both as a First Nations woman and a Métis woman because of the, the things that I've learned along the way in my company as it relates to tourism and what I've been able to share with people. And um, you know, the elders I've reached out to, the, the teachings that I've been gifted with along the way has really cemented the fact that it, it is such a beautiful way to, um, to be in the world, to embrace that indigenous side of yourself uh, unapologetically. You know, we were taught for so many years by my grandmother to hide who we were, to never speak of it. I mean, I don't look indigenous at all. And going to school, we were um, we were told to keep that very quiet, and we were never allowed to speak of it. We were never allowed to share that part of our culture. And so now being able to do that in my business has really cemented that identity for me. It must be wonderful to be able to share it so openly now. It really is. I mean, it's cool to be us. Yeah. <laughs> is there a teaching you've learned along the way that's really stuck with you? Um, gosh, there's there are so many teachings um, that have really stuck with me. I think you know, for me, it, it just it simply goes back to um, um, a whole multitude of teachings, mostly from my grandmother, but also from a really strong mother. Uh, my grandmother always wanted to hide who we were, and my mother always wanted to celebrate and shout it through the rooftops about who we were. And, um, and I think what I got from that 
um, in a very different way was um, sometimes it was okay to be really quiet about who I was, and other times it was really okay to celebrate who I was. Um, but from that, no matter who I was um, in relation to either my mother or my grandmother, the one thing that always kept popping up was um, the land is everything to us. That That's just my central being, is the land is everything to us. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing so much. Ah, ah, ah. Oh, wait, can I watch your face do it? That's what I'm doing. Just get your thumbs down into your throat here. Close your nose. Get real nasally. Get really, okay. really whiny. Ah. 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 Exactly. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I've uh, actually uh, watched a raven do um, uh, an elk bugle uh, near a bull elk during mating season, flying from tree to tree and driving this elk nuts. <laughs> it is running back and forth trying to find this other bull, but it's just a raven just it's having fun. Raven. Yeah. <laughs> they really are tricksters, eh? Yep.